Okay, welcome everyone to this first panel. We have uh, great, great minds in the vacation rental today. So it's gonna be very intense, I think. And uh, I'm gonna do a very, very quick introduction on why we're here, what we, we're talking about, and then I'm gonna let uh, each one of you guys say what you think about the, the subject. So basically, welcome everyone who's, who's connected right now. Uh, first of all, we are um, connected first day Richard from UK, Richard from Rentivo and Yes Consulting. Uh, we have Matt from Miami, Miami from B, sorry, Matt from BRMB. There you are, Matt. Simon from Switzerland. And this is not a Zoom background, that's a real thing. <laughs> Simon from AGL Consulting. And then we have Vanessa from Barcelona, right, Vanessa? Correct. From Rentals mm -hmm. United. And, uh, and then we have Gianpaolo from Host B2B, who is doing the tech support. Thank you very much, Gianpaolo, for, for your help. My and pleasure. So let's start. Okay. So, hi. Sorry, go ahead, Vanessa. No, I don't know. You said let's start. And let's start. Yeah. So, I'm going to start. And then <laughs> so, okay. Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. We're here because we're moving from Web 2 to Web 3. Let me do a very quick recap of what ha what's happened in the last 25 years. So web one is the web where we could, most people could not write, people could only read. It was very hard to write something online because the technology was slow, there was slow connection, and it was very hard to write something and then you had to restart the page, reload the page. You probably, some of you guys remember that time. Web one is when companies like Home away were ruling, okay? And home away was mostly a listing site where you would pay them to get traffic and the transaction belonged to you as a property manager. Uh, we would not even call hosts at the time. So property managers and owners had to do most of the job and they were paying a company or a few companies to get traffic, okay? So that was more like a listing site, like a newspaper selling you visibility. Uh, it was much harder to work at the time, but you also had more control on your business, right? And then Web2 came along. Web2 started because the technology of the internet evolved and it was much easier to write stuff. So the masses became, started to write stuff. And we had Facebook, for instance, right? Um, that allowed companies like Airbnb to rethink the platform, okay? So it became easier for people to upload listings, keep calendars updated, communicate with customers. They didn't even have to worry about payments because now payments were taken care of by Airbnb, okay, first, and then the others followed. It became easier, more people came in, um, the, the business, the vacation rental offer exploded, but at the same time, we lost control of the transaction. And we are now in a situation where everything is in the hands of these platforms and we don't have much control. They do everything for us. So with little responsibility, with little power comes little responsibility. We kind of lost control of what's happening. Web2 is the web of the corporations. Facebook, Google, Amazon, Netflix, Booking, you Uber and so on. And these corporations have are, are, are got really, really powerful, more than some governments, okay? Some of these companies have more money than nation states. Now, that's where we are today. Web3, that's where we kind of tend to, I tend to lose uh, when people listen to me, like what the hell is Web3? First of all, Web3 is the web, which is evolving, it's nothing new. You probably have heard about the blockchain. And I won't explain you what the blockchain is, but Web3 is the web where we take back control of our data. So in a platform of the Web3, we have an account like we have in Booking or Airbnb, but this account is ours. They cannot close it, okay? So I have an account and I'm gonna use it on every OTA, but if the OTA shuts down, I keep my account. If the OTA shuts down, I keep my listing. If the OTA shuts down, I keep my reviews. Everything is in my hands. 
okay? Me as a user. So I can be a property manager with a hundred apartments and Airbnb for any reason, the platforms, my, my listing closes my listing. It's okay, I lost Airbnb, but I haven't lost my listings and I haven't lost my reviews. My reviews are gonna be in one place and I allow OTAs to display them, okay? So we take back control, which means we also need to go back a bit to web one where we were more responsible. So that's the basic idea. And I'm not gonna go into why this is possible today, what cryptocurrencies are have to do with that, it doesn't matter. That's what we have to keep in mind, okay? So I'm going to the questions and I'm gonna start with, with Vanessa. Vanessa, I'm gonna give you two thought experiments and you choose, you pick the one you prefer, okay? okay. So let's say tomorrow morning you get a call and there's Brian Chesky on the phone and he tells you, I'm out of here. I don't wanna run Airbnb anymore. We have paid off every investor, okay? Would you like to run Airbnb? Do what you want with it, uh, as long as they don't lose money. You don't even need to make money anymore because there's no investors, okay? You just need to get some money from the customers and use it to keep it alive, okay? So you can transform this into a public infrastructure or do what you want with it. Uh, just make the interest of the users. The users are property manager, hosts, guests, software companies, channel managers, etc. right? That's all. So do what you want with it. You don't need to make money anymore with it. Make it a good thing for everybody in the industry and the users and the guests. And the second thought experiment, which is basically the same thing, and you pick again the one you prefer, is like tomorrow morning you will have a billion dollars in your bank account and you have a letter which says build a neutral platform to make the industry, the vacation rental industry, a better place. Okay. So what would you do in one of these two scenarios? So pick one and then how would you build this new platform or how would you adapt Airbnb or whatever booking in this new environment? Um, and you start from the starting points that OTAs are bad, right? That we lose control, which is not completely my standpoint. Um, in my view, uh, the, the, the reality of it is that when you're, when you're an OTA, uh, you need to, to, to market this website, right? And you were asking what a traveler wants, what is the best for a traveler? The best for a traveler is finding these websites that I can book on. Uh, and in order for that to happen, you need marketing dollar, right? Um, and so as a result, you, you do need to make money in order to spend the money in marketing, right? So in this world that you're proposing, um, I think they're doing a perfectly good job. They created, Airbnb created a, an industry which already existed, but promoted this industry. Uh, tons of people are making money through it. Um, from, uh, from the traveler perspective, they seem to be very happy. I mean, that's what our stats show even after the crisis. Uh, so I'm not really sure if this should be the starting point. If, if you're saying, how can we make it better um, in terms of contracts and keeping your reviews, okay. But at the end of the day, I think they're doing a, a pretty awesome job. And, and I know there is this whole, uh, uh, what shall we say? Uh, movement in the book direct industry and I fully appreciate it. However, I was an OTA at one point and I can tell you, uh, you need marketing dollar to make it work. <clears throat> it's a very competitive market and, uh, and as a result, you need money. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not really Just sure. Just to clarify the whole experiment, uh, you would still need to charge people for using it. Okay. And you, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And okay. maybe, so, maybe not that commission, maybe a little less, but yeah. And you spend yeah. this money for marketing and, and everything else. So, okay. Still a company, so there's still one, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's one interesting model that I see, uh, that I discovered quite recently and it's the membership model where, uh, instead of charging the hotels or the VR, you, you, you charge the traveler a, a membership fee per year and they then assure the best pricing, etc. I think that's a, a nice model to, to explore. Uh, for, for somebody like who would be that huge and they then use the, the money for, for marketing. Yeah, that potentially could be something, the membership model. Okay, mm. great. So membership model, that's a good point. Actually, that's an interesting um, development out there. I think it's Bidroom you are yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I 
following these guys. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So let's pass. Let's go to Matt. Thank you, Vanessa. Cheers. Matt, what would be your your answer to the question? Would you like me to repeat it, or it's fine? Uh, yeah. Could you repeat it? Okay. So if tomorrow an OTA calls you and says. Um, Please run, run this OTA doing the interest, uh, interest of the users. Okay, so the, the property managers, the guests, the software companies, everybody. And don't worry about making an extra profit, make it break even. So charge money, spend the money, but don't worry about maximizing shareholder returns because there are no, no shareholders anymore, basically. Uh, what would you do? How, what would you change from a starting point of the actual today's OTAs, which as, as Vanessa was saying, they are doing an incredibly good job. I mean, from web one to web two, the difference is amazing. It's much, much better. And our space is bigger. So, uh, but can we improve on that? Or are we at the end of history? So is this like the perfect model, perfect balance, or can we do better? Okay. Um, I think my, my solution, would be somewhere in the middle of both of those two options. So if I was handed um, the reins of Airbnb, I do think that it could revert back to a true community in which the stakeholders, that is to say the owners, the managers, the hosts, um, owned a piece of the puzzle. I think that would be possible. Uh, however, there's a very deep problem with what Airbnb has created. And it is a sense of entitlement amongst the stakeholders. And this is the way that the company has evolved. And it's not terribly unlike the other OTAs. Um, I often use the word victimization. If you ever see a rant online from an owner or manager, you actually are hearing a victimization narrative. This OTA did this to me. They, did, they changed the rules. My competitor did this to me. And it's all everybody else's fault except my own. So I think the deep problem that Airbnb would need to change would be reversing that mindset from I'm the victim to I'm actually a participating member of this community. Um, I don't know if that's irreversible or not. Uh, I do know that the, the deal that owners and managers have received from all OTAs over the years has been getting a little bit less good <laughs> each quarter, a little bit less um, attractive. So if I was to take that second option and say, how would I start things from scratch? It would have to have the protagonist mindset built into the model. And that's a completely different business model than a corporation where shareholders are demanding a return. Uh, it starts to look a lot more like a cooperative business model, which is something that I've been researching a lot in the last year. Uh, and a cooperative, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a business. It needs the same founder or group of founders, um, you know, capital to get started. It's the same as a business, with the exception that each of the participating members own the business. Each stakeholder has a vote that is equal. Cooperatives are traditional uh, here in the States in things like agriculture. Um, Ace Hardware is a cooperative, which gives an independent hardware shopkeeper in Miami Beach the ability to offer a unique um, set of products to their local community, but also gives them the ability to bulk purchase their hammers and their nails and things like this. Lando Lakes is another cooperative that I like here in the States. It's with a bunch of dairy farmers and they sell butter. It's one of the biggest uh, butter companies in the world. I, I'm pretty sure cooperatives are very popular in Europe as well, although I'm not they familiar are. with too many of them. 
Um, but what I would do with that second scenario is I would require those who wanted to own a piece of the solution to participate and to earn it. And this is significantly different from a transaction in which I pay you a certain amount of money to get a booking. It's very different. Um, how would I do it? I would start with the existing short-term rental alliances throughout the world who have created great um, relationships with local owners and managers who have begun standing up for their rights, who have begun uh, advocacy campaigns, who have formed meaningful communities uh, of short-term rental stakeholders in any given destination. That right now is the most real looking um, group of vacation rental um, stakeholders that exist. And, and we have them throughout Europe as well. I would start with those existing flows, those existing um, hierarchies with leadership and all the people who have uh, supported them. And I would create listing sites for each of these individual destinations in which each of the owners and managers who participated owned and managed a piece of the greater puzzle. A cooperative business model is structured a little bit differently financially, but it basically ensures that you uh, get to write the rules. The rules don't change until there's an overwhelming uh, vote, majority. Um, and it's basically everybody's in this together. And you do, uh, you can work in investors who invest in cooperative type business models. Um, but more than anything else, if, and I've spoken with a number of short-term rental alliances, every owner and manager in a destination decided we're fed up, we don't want to use Airbnb anymore. Um, and, and they they boycotted the platform and removed all their inventory and placed it in a new site. Yes, you need money to market it. And Vanessa made a great point there. However, you also hold the precious asset and that is the inventory. And that is ultimately where travelers will go. So I think there is a potential new decentralized looking organization there. Um, competing with the booking.coms of the world for a new uh, guest is increasingly difficult. And back to my first point to end this, I think at the very core, the problem here is the way people view these listing sites. And if you think it's, they owe it to you to deliver you bookings, um, I don't think that line of thought gets us anywhere into the future. I think it requires a completely different mindset shift. And I do believe a cooperative business model uh, would be uh, one way to do that. It's uh, as I was listening to you, Matt, it's basically as if you were describing what Web3 is for. It's basically that it, it, it's as if it was built for this kind of model. So really, really interesting. And, and the model is old, as you were saying, that the cooperatives the internet has catched up, has, has called up. And it got to a point where it can support this kind of model, which is a traditional model. Very good. Okay, that was great. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa, thank you, Matt. So, Simon. Yeah, you don't. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. You don't uh, you need to repeat the question. I think uh, I understood course. it. And, and I really yeah. enjoyed the input. Uh, from from both Matt and, and Vanessa before, and obviously having had the advantage to think a little bit longer, which mm -hmm. uh, helped in, in actually oh, yeah. getting getting heated up in the conversation. I'm in vacation mode, so I'm sitting in the Swiss Alps on like six thousand feet right now and enjoying my evening, and that's good for your brain to to reflect. But actually, what what you're asking is, you know, is is capitalism is capitalism capitalism dead? That's the question, right? because ultimately every business model that we're looking at is driven by capitalism. And, and therefore the, the thesis or the approach of, of Matt I found super interesting and interesting enough, the largest co-op in the world is actually in Switzerland. It's a $24 billion food retailer, uh, which is Migros and they basically are a co-op and every Swiss person, which is I think about 8 million of them now have a share, a uh, hundred bucks. So this this company can't be bought this company can't be sold and they're producing every year 
you know, three, three digit million uh, profits, they can reinvest, they have so much money to reinvest and build the business bigger. So they've built that on the view of, of a co-op. And I, I like that a lot, but going back to, so I can give you a lot of background, uh, Matt, and I'm happy to, to share a bit of history of that company with you. And, and it's, it's super old and it's, you know, they started with the farmers and they ended up being, the, you know, a $24 billion company. Uh, and it's a, it's a COVID. It's a bit hard to manage because uh, the structures are a bit different, um, but uh, it, it's super interesting. And, and they, they are here. They're nearly an NGO, basically, so they need to deliver the right thing to the consumer. But having prepared for that question and being in the situation of, of a CEO of an OTA, no matter which one it is, I think, you know, one of the biggest problems and, and having been and having, having been the CEO of Focusrite as well, where we thought, a lot about and did a lot of research around, you know, travel research in general by the consumer. And we still say today, and let's, when we talk about Web 3.0 for my purpose right now, we're talking about the, the tourism vertical, the travel vertical. We can talk about a lot of other verticals as well, being it, you know, retail or, or automation or other technologies or financial technology. But now we're talking about travel. And still today, we have not been able to to manage travel search. It's still broken. Travel search on the web is still broken today. And I experience that literally every year. Obviously, I'm taking only vacation rental homes uh, for my vacation, especially now. And we booked a beautiful chalet here in the Swiss Alps. But to actually find that place is a total nightmare. And, and exactly to your, to your point, because the OTAs, they're capturing, they're trying to capture consumer, the, the guest, and they want to, as, 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 as Matt puts it in his words, the, the victimization, they try to keep you within their own ecosystem. They don't want to let you go, but they don't know you at all. We always talk about how, how many years now have we talked about personalization? Who has managed to personalize in this environment? For, for me as a consumer, to be perfectly honest to you, no one has. I mean, not in terms of my digital footprint that I'm leaving behind, which is quite substantial. I'm not too worried about it, so I'm, I'm, but I'm conscious about it. But even my digital footprint that I'm leaving behind has not been able to be captured by anyone to give me a better booking experience, a better, a, a better buying experience at all. I need to start all over again and, and you know, I think this personalization issue is, is a piece of what you, you basically gave the answer, Luca, in your, in your introduction. Because if, if I could give my profile away and, and it's mine in terms of my reviews, in terms of what I need when I travel, when I go on vacation, when I do business travel or whatever, I have different needs, right? My, my needs are changing constantly across the year. You know, if, if I'm on a business if I'm on a trip just with my wife or if I'm on a trip with my entire family, things are different. But I, you know, every time I go on a booking site, I need, to, I need to start all over again. And just because I made one booking, I can't believe how often, and I go to Barcelona on a regular basis, and I can't believe how often I'm, I'm getting hotel uh, proposals for Barcelona, but this is not my next trip, right? So I know where to go. So I go somewhere else and, and then a vacation as well. So this, this personalization issue is that if that is given back to me as an audience and as a community, then I'm more than happy to, to share that and platforms can, can provide me the best possible experience that I'm actually looking for based on, 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 on my personalization. But I want to own the personalization. This is why we're always ticking you know, I don't want to get newsletters. I want to, I don't want to get this. I don't want to get that. I don't want to, this information being used for marketing purposes. You know, every, every six months, you sort of clean out your, 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 uh, your inbox with all the newsletters you need to unsubscribe because you re receive hundreds of them. It's just, a, it's a nightmare. So I feel, you know, and we have, we would potentially have that day. As long as you, we have the peace of mind that it's, that it's ours and we can protect it. So, I mean, data security, is, is, is becoming a massive issue, especially now with COVID-19, with tracing apps even more so. I mean, you know, I want to tell people where I am because I want to protect myself. I want to protect the others. So, but the data 
people are worried what is happening with the data and if that can be sort of protected also in, in the travel and, and, and we can collaborate to the point that Matt mentioned in terms of a community uh, and building a stronger community and not just trying to capture and, and being totally isolated. If you use an Airbnb platform or a booking platform or a home away, you ha we have zero flexibility in what we do as a property manager, but also as, a, as, a, as an RBO and as a, as a guest. And I think we need to open that up. We need to have a way of, of collaborating and, and communicating with each other that we can build a better experience, that we get exactly what we're looking for. But as long as we're trying to capture the consumer within our own ecosystem and not letting him go anywhere else, then I think it's, it's just, it, it, it never be, will be fixed. And I also like the point that, <clears throat> that Vanessa made in terms of, of bid room and this, this membership. I'm very close to these guys and, and, and seeing them now exploding in terms of traffic and in terms of partners who want to join that network is incredible. You pay a small um, a fee, a membership fee a year, and you're guaranteed that wherever you go, you pay less than you pay, for example, an OTA, a car rental company, whatever it might be. And, the, and, and it's, it's, it speaks for itself that the providers of the inventory are all doing it. I mean, every large hotel chain has signed up with Bidroom. Every large um, big, um, uh, car rental company has signed up with them. So it's, it's about giving more choice. And I think the more we try to capture, the less choice the, the consumer gets. And that's where it, it, it still stuck, so is, is stuck because we try to keep everybody on our own platform and, and we don't want to share that with anybody else. But I think if you, as a membership, can have access to all these amazing products without having to be worried um, to, to re, be, be retargeted all the time, I think it's, it, it's definitely a good start. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, you, you started with capitalism, capitalism is dead. And uh, well, I don't, I don't think so. I hope not. But for sure, it's the best way, in my opinion, the, the best way we found to organize groups of people around a specific target is by getting capturing profit. Uh, but again, is this the end of history? Is it what humans have, have, has, have reached and we're never going to go beyond that? Probably not. I mean, I hope we have thousands of years in front of us. So, and the cooperative model is one of those models which is getting less views, is, is not so um, talked about, but it is there. So us to, to think new, new ways to do things. And because the web is improving, then maybe we're going to be forced to do that because either we do it or somebody else, we do that. And to, to touch about the point about the, the silos of data where every company keeps the data and doesn't share it and makes personalization impossible. Uh, next Thursday, we have another panel, which is on open protocols, which basically means data is going everywhere and everybody can create a startup or create a company or a service on this data. Regarding to what you're saying, Web3 is probably good news. Thank you very much. So, Richard, yeah, let's see, let's see what you have to say. Yeah, I didn't catch all that, Luca. You broke up a little bit. Oh, there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, well, yeah, go ahead. Don't worry. I've I've had the benefit of uh, <laughs> Matt, Vanessa, and Simon. So it's been a yeah. It's actually um, it's. It's added a lot more to what I was going to say, so it's been uh, it's been quite fascinating hearing what that you've all said. So Simon was last, um, and I I completely agree with the personalization. So you know, personalization is something that uh, has to be addressed going forward, and we're all pretty fed up of being hammered continuously by adverts for going to Torquay where I live, which is crazy because I don't need to stay in a hotel here. So the personalization bit is is very important. I think I'll probably start with thinking why we're we having this conversation as well. So um, actually Web2, HomeAway, Onus Direct, Holiday Lettings, all those uh, little websites actually, when if you're a supplier in those days, it wasn't so bad actually. Uh, we would never have had that conversation because the market wasn't so big and you're only paying 85 quid uh, a year for a listing and you got 40 bookings and everybody was happy. It, it was, it, it's this growth, this explosion that's caused the issues. 
And it comes back again to what Simon said about capitalism, because you know, we are now in a, we're in a very intense pressure uh, environment. And, and the big problem that I witness uh, and my businesses witness is the lack of margin involved in this. If everybody was making bookings and no one was paying anything and they made sufficient every year, we wouldn't actually be having this conversation. Um, and it's the fact that the information has become siloed, it's been mentioned already. Um, and uh, we know that the take from the OTAs is likely to go up. Now, I think we'd all be pretty impressed if we all started an OTA because, you know, we'd be pretty rich out of the whole thing. They're not going away, they're part of the ecosystem and they will be used. So, you know, don't, don't think you can ever remove them. But the trend tends to be to try and find a way to dilute the effect of them. Simple as that. So uh, Matt um, came out with a cooperative model, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, been trying to get people together for the last 20 years to do stuff. So I'm a great fan of trips. Uh, we, in the Rentivo business, we run Love Cottages, uh, the technical side of it, which has uh, 15,000 properties from 65 managers. They've all invested. Uh, it's a marketplace, and people make book the, the managers make their own bookings, and, and everything works quite smoothly. So that that's a really nice way of doing things. Um, bedroom, yeah, I love bedroom. I think that's a brilliant idea. The membership stuff, and uh, yeah, I'm not surprised everybody's signing up to that because you're getting the best price, and you're paying a small fee for that sort of stuff. Um, there's a big issue here. And Vanessa sitting there against her library is, um, is part of the solution to some of this. Um, and it's a very complex environment. So if you took um, Matt's cooperative, and I'm, as I said, I'm a great fan of that. And you said to all these managers and everybody else around the world, listen guys, we're just gonna create one great big cooperative it's, not, it's going to be a non-profit. We're going to reinvest everything in advertising. The technical challenges are huge. They are just huge. Bedroom uses the, uh, the hotel uh, API format. This is a, a lot simpler coming from a hotel environment than a, than a rental environment. So the technical challenges of doing any of this sort of stuff are, are, are quite large. But I do think as time moves on, uh, you will see them uh, become uh, more straightforward. There'll be a lot more standardization going on in the APIs and you will be able to communicate much more with each other. I think if you gave me a, a million dollars right now, I'd go for the Nirvana approach and I'd spend it all up in R&D and get an R&D reclaim as well on it. Because somewhere in here, there is artificial intelligence. There is the capacity to be able to say, we've got 10 million rentals worldwide, let's say six or seven million are IOTAs, but they're also on other websites. And a lot of them are direct websites, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is a very, as I said, a Nirvana approach. There is the capacity to actually go and find that property and book it direct if you really, really want to. The trouble is people don't bother. They want a big selection in a single place. There's a trust element to it and everything else. And this is where it all breaks apart with uh, direct booking. You might be able to go and find that property directly and book it, but actually do you trust the website to book it? You tend to trust the large companies with the trust messages and the brand messages. And actually, the one that's completely frictionless. It's the one that on your phone that you just go, yeah, yeah, I'll book that. I'm staying three nights in Barcelona, blah, blah. I don't care. I don't care who's lost money. It's, I'm a guest. It's irrelevant to me. So if you took the guest side of it, whatever comes forward has to be frictionless and it has to probably be modeled on an OTA because they've spent billions and billions of dollars actually getting this right from a guest perspective. From the supply perspective, I'm pretty sure if that number, that commission number, was reduced, then you, you'd see much less aggravation in the industry, full stop. Because this margin 
is killing people. And that's the problem in certain areas. So there's been a lot, let's, let's, I mean, we've got different markets. We've got uh, vacation rentals, we've got urban markets, we've got technology plays, we've got everybody. If you can imagine something like um, a master lease urban company, a little close to my heart, imagine they have 5,000 units and they make 50 bookings a year and it costs them $50 commission on every booking for say a $350 booking, say two or three nights. That's gonna cost them $12.5 million a year in commissions. And there's a, there's a lack of appreciation in, in probably a lot of those companies as they scale in terms of we should be looking a bit further forward to try and get some more direct bookings and lower commission bookings and loyalty programs and membership programs and big room stuff and everything else. So simply it's too much money, but there's actually, there's a monster in the room here as well. And it's Google. So, you know, you might build the world's biggest, best cooperative site. And I, I love the idea, seriously. And I'm fully in favor of this sort of thing. It will still need to make enough money to compete with those large companies who we are calling the OTAs uh, in search. So the only way to navigate that is to go back to Nirvana and have some automated process, which you can actually do the personalization for you. So if you take Simon's idea of personalization, you build your own personal personalization portfolio. That technology goes and finds the properties that are suitable for you and then finds them actually where they're the cheapest and the best represented and the best insured and everything else. And we all know that that is actually at source. A, a meta search. <laughs> well, I wasn't gonna search. say the word meta search, but you're, you're kind of getting there. A meta search still takes too big a commission. And it's this value, it's this amount of money that kills a lot of businesses. If you're an individual owner and you, let's say you book, I don't know, 25 weeks a year and you turn in 25,000 pounds and you pay out two and a half thousand pounds, you pay cleaners, it's fine. But if you're a manager who takes 15 to 20%, you, you're beginning to, you're going to need scale. You're going to need to be a, a Sykes or a Vercasa to actually allow you to compete at the top of the funnel on the search engines and the brand awareness. So um, personally, I, I think the cooperative approach with advanced, uh, more advanced technology to allow this sort of stuff to happen is the way to go. We know Rentals United, Vanessa sitting in the corner of my screen, is very focused on niche sites too. And niche to me means languages, it means destinations, and it means a focus on particular subject matter. So in the short term, you can build these things with some investment. You can do a destination, you can be a DMO, you can do a language site, you can specialize in Italian or German or something like this. And these are very hard for the OTAs to actually attempt. You, you cannot become a specialist as an OTA in something like uh, surfing on the west coast of the United States. But you can build small platforms that will give you a, a good level of direct bookings provided you invest in it and you'll have to do it as a cooperative because you won't have, you won't have the input or the feed to do it. So um, there's no simple answer Luca, but I think the, the moral answer is to, um, to attempt to try and pull data together in a simplified form with a lower commission. If you don't have to pay shareholders, if you could do a Migros in, of Switzerland for rentals globally, you, you'd be so popular. <laughs> but, okay. There, the the aspect of niche sites, and, and Vanessa is very focused on that. And uh, I would like to ask Vanessa, what what are the difficulties for niche sites to be successful? Uh, because I think Web3 here helps again, and I'll tell you maybe later why. What are the the biggest hurdles for a niche site to be successful today? Well, I, I look at it from the inventory point of view, right? So I have the inventory and, and then the question is, do they want to go on these niche sites? So I can tell you what the inventory is looking for. 
And most of the time, if they're serious professional property managers and a bit bigger, which is our segment, they get approached by niche sites every single day. Okay. Uh, comment onto my website, you know, because the niche sites needs obviously product in order to spend money on marketing, etc. And um, and so the niche site, the, the property managers are bombarded with niche sites every day. So how do they make their decision to work with a niche site? They basically look at investment. Does this company has marketing box in order to bring me booking? Because it is an, a time investment. It sometimes is a monetary investment as well. You know, you have to um, you know get the channel manager that works with it, etc. And, and there's a lot of time, you know, and you have to make your math. Is this going to be worth my time to actually go onto this niche website? So the number one factor they look at is, did it get investment? How long, and then how long is it around? What's the average booking value, etc. So I, I, I can't tell you how, you know, a niche website to me, and I've seen them come and go in the last five years. To me, what would, what is successful in my mind is the, are the ones that really focus on a, a specific niche. So as opposed to being a smaller OTA that tries to do everything for everyone, it's one that is very much focused as, uh, as, as, uh, as Richard was saying, on, tour, on sports, on digital nomads, on midterm, on long-term, whatever it is, but really focuses on that. And then they're more likely to be successful. And then yeah, they're have- really I had a conversation about that this morning, uh, Luca, exactly on a niche website. And it all comes down to being a real specialist in that subject matter. And if that's, if that's dogs, for example, you need to, you need to network it with beaches, with walks, with very deep information. And one of the problems that Vanessa will face in in all this distribution is that when somebody puts the information on their website, it will be pushed to an OTA or it might be on a manager's website. Very seldom do you find any real in-depth information related to any of these niche aspects. So, you know, let's say dogs, for example. You know, we know that 20, you might get 20% more bookings if you take pets, but how many people actually say, well, I accept two pets and they're short-haired or long-haired. They can actually sleep in the lounge. They can jump on the beds. The garden is protected. We leave. If you do that, if you go to that level, then you will become successful in your own particular environment. You know, being being a generalist and having a million properties on your website is just a waste of time. You just can't, you can't succeed. Let me tell you why I think web tree will be good for, for niche sites. Uh, First of all, because, I think one of the, the weaknesses of these websites could be the fact that their software, their, their front end is not as good as Airbnb or Booking. So everyone has to start again from the beginning and rewrite the whole uh, user experience. And it's really hard and, and, and it's expensive. So WebTree is mostly an open source code. Uh, think about Linux, you know, Linux was this small project to make a competition to Microsoft and it was completely free and people were simply writing code. And a few years later, Linux is stronger than Microsoft on every single server and it's even on Android phone. So there's gonna be basically ready to use code for everybody. You wanna do a niche site on a very specific thing. You just get the code and you have a running website, website in one hour. And the second thing, you're gonna have access to all this inventory probably with the same problem of people not wanting to accept to be part of yours. But a big thing, every single listing you're getting comes with reviews. So the reviews they collected in the last five years, you can use them in your niche site. Why today, if I launch a niche site, I start with a listing with zero reviews, right? I think uh, there's this new company. I think Simon, you helped them. They, they, they won the review the architect, right? Uh, yeah. That's very interesting. You take your reviews. Sam, when you are muted, so yeah, they're finalists. Yeah, um, they're finalists on the VR Tech, which is uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. They're called Reviews. They're based in yeah, uh, reviews, yeah. Madrid, and they're basically providing a widget to your website with all your reviews that you have generated on all third-party channels, which is helping you to perform better on SEO and 
and uh, and and obviously be much closer to the reviews as well. So um, it's it's an incredible uh, technology. It has never, you know, this is the first in our industry who's doing it that way. And um, we're amazed when we did actually, when we when we did uh, we we did strategic consulting to them, and we looked at the the tech landscape, and we looked at the comp set, and we looked at short-term rental companies, very large ones, property managers of very big names and how little to nothing they do with their reviews. It's absolutely insane. Like reviews that, that they potentially generate, there's nothing there. It's, it's just nothing there. So, so even stuff that is already available in terms of data, we don't even use. So that's, that's quite incredible. So that, that's, uh, I think for niche websites, Vanessa, the, the, the fact that companies like review exist is going to change a lot the impact doesn't it yeah um, i think he thinks of it the business model is for your own website not so much uh, for an ota okay. but i guess an ota okay. could take it too yeah, yeah why not okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay matt what do you think would you want to add something uh there's a question from Henrietta, actually which uh, i know you know her maybe is it you want to answer to her about this because she's talking about the cooperatives in europe and Sure. Do you think it's essential to be local to succeed? Would you like me to read you? Can you read the, the question in the, in the chat there? I, I can't read it. Ah, oh, because you're on my phone. Okay. So Henrietta says, I wrote my thesis on secondary cooperatives in Europe, and uh, I never thought about them in VR. Is it similar to what TRIPS is building? Do you think it is essential to be local to succeed? Like these cooperatives, do, have, do they have to be local, or can they be like migros, or migros which is, okay national can it be international could it be global you for it to work in my research you need for the stakeholders to have a common goal the more specific that goal is the stronger the cooperative is so um, an example of a really strong goal would be, I want my biz vacation rental business in Rome, let's use Henrietta's example, to generate direct bookings, 75% uh, direct. I, I wanna generate more direct bookings. I wanna build a more sustainable vacation rental business. If you have a bunch of stakeholders who have one goal and you can create a set of rules that the cooperative will operate by, you have something. A, a different way of thinking about this, forget about vacation rentals, forget about listing sites. Like listing sites are very unique. And I think we've all become sort of um, jaded in a way that we have this tool that gets our property up onto the market and we can generate a booking overnight. A restaurant or a small craftsman, maybe with the exception of a site like Etsy, they've never seen these kinds of tools before. So forget all about the listing sites. Forget all about vacation rentals for a moment. Think about a community, a neighborhood, let's say even. Um, I'll use the example of the neighborhood that I moved to in Panama in 2006, which was uh, still a very underdeveloped historic district. Everybody there had one goal, to live in Casco Viejo. That goes for me, that goes for um, the grandmother who had lived in her home for 50 years, that goes for the gang members that I worked very closely with. Everybody wanted one thing, and it was to live in this neighborhood, preferably safely, without being shot at. That's a pretty specific goal. And once you have that goal as a group, you can all contribute towards the betterment of that goal. In our case, uh, of course, housing was an important matter because if you're going to live there, you need a safe place to live. But now we begin to apply this to vacation rental cooperatives. If everybody in the group, in the destination has one goal, the more specific that goal is, the stronger the cooperative has the potential to be. Um, 
I, I think it gets weaker the broader you get. And I also think it's much harder to, it just would take so much time and resources to get all these people into one um, space versus Henrietta could probably make a couple phone calls and get the majority of the professional vacation rental owners in Rome into one virtual summit. That's not totally unrealistic. Those flows exist. So it would be accelerating those flows. It would be equipping those existing relationships and getting those people to achieve their common goal together. And by the way, all of those goals may be different across different destinations. Rome, vacation rental professionals may have one common goal, which is very different from the vacation rental community in the Swiss Alps, which is very different from the vacation rental community in, in Miami Beach. They may all, may all be completely different. Of course, they may all also have a number of commonalities. Uh, but I do think that the more each of these different communities needs to solve its own problems. And the longer we sit and wait for some listing site to come and solve it for, them, for us, uh, I think the more painful it gets, the listing sites have proven um, that, that the owners and the managers are not their first priority. And the last saving grace here, I think, is that in our industry, the precious asset is the inventory. And if you as a property owner, or as you the manager of an exclusive set of properties decide that you don't wanna do it that way, that you're gonna do it your own way, you actually hold the key to the kingdom, I believe. Okay. Right. Do you wanna say something, Vanessa or Richard? As yes, you rate it? yeah, okay. now you said me first. <laughs> okay, you said first Vanessa. No, I actually wanna tell you guys that, guys that I know of a company that runs that way, a property management company. It's a corporation in Denmark they're called in Sweden, they're called the Ferrier Partner. So they're across two, two countries. And they're made out of 27 um, rental agencies. And they have democratic principles as to how, how they vote, how, how they run the business. So 27 Can you agencies. Can the chat later, Vanessa? Yeah, so yeah. ferrierpartner.dk. Yeah. Ferrier and Ferrier. name Ferrier, F-E-R-I-E, -E. yeah, partner. And so these 27 agencies got together and, and, and they vote on how the company, uh, how the company uh, goes along. They have 83% direct bookings and, and they have now 7,000 rentals. At least the last time I interviewed them. And, and they're flying to Sweden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, they exist. It's it the same model in Finland. Same mm -hmm. model in Finland called Lomarengas. So you can, uh, that's exact. It's a co-op company board. They, they, you know, they all decide everything collectively and are also made up from different agencies for anybody who's watching sorry go ahead <laughs> vanessa so i also know an ota that is a cooperative which you, you guys i'm sure know as well it's called fairbnb.coop it's an oh. italian a startup yeah and their corporation and they're, they're an ota corporation um so so the model has been explored i think maybe on a small yeah level. i mean i'm just posting a, a link in the uh, well, I always post a link in the chat. I mean, as I said earlier, we, we have 15,000 in Rentilo and above cottages from these 60 managers and they have a cooperative, it's a company, they make poor decisions, everybody is involved in this and they have very good terms for their clients. But just go back to what Matt said, actually. Um, in the UK, everything is turning to this, uh, this uh, paid search control of, of so many industries. We, in the UK, we have Bark and Bidvine. So um, my wife, Sue, is a photographer. Uh, and if anybody looks for a photographer these days, you get hammered and bark and bidvine. You can go and right. ask for a photographer for your wedding and you get 40 of them and it costs uh, like 40 pounds to get an inquiry, this sort of stuff. It's, it, comes back to, it comes back to what size can you actually develop one of these uh, platforms to, maybe initially. And you can't do it on a global basis because you just don't have the capacity to beat Google at any of this. And Google is hell bent on taking a slice of the action no matter what we say. So you really have to think very, very focused and very, very niche to start with, I think. And Luca, I mean, I love trips. And I think the concept of actually allowing to have open source code to allow anybody 
to take this information and build their own platform in a very simple way with reviews attached to it, inventory attached to it, uh, is, a, is a great way of doing it, in fact. I'm not in, I look forward to the first day I see one of these things coming along as well, because um, it could be a change of mindset continue, uh, going forward as well. But I, 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 I think in the future, you're gonna look at your TV set and your TV, and you're just going to say, find me a villa in uh, the Algarve. And the artificial intelligence and everything or whatever will just go off and it will say, yeah, I found three great places, Simon. Would you like the one with a really big swimming pool and the shoe cleaner? Um, yeah, and Simon will go, yeah, usual budget. Just find me the best deal, best price, best insurance. Book it for me these days. And, and it will be done behind the scenes. And I'm not entirely sure the OTAs will be that powerful at that point because the best price is actually not going to be on an OTA. It's going to be directly somehow via a cooperative or directly from the, uh, the owner and the manager. And let's face it, they're getting more sophisticated. Everybody's technology is getting better and better and better. So, you know, we can expect a, probably a sea change in the next five years and stuff we've never even imagined. So. Um. What, what Matt said um, about, you know, having a very clear objective and I'm going to uh, ask you this question and, and then we're going to close. So if you allow me 10, 15 minutes more and then, and then we are done. Um, the question is connected also to what Vanessa said at the beginning, you need marketing dollars, right? Which is the first thing everybody says and, and it's true. Uh, the whole game is about getting eyeballs on everything today on the internet. Attention is the real value today getting people's attention. Now, Matt said, we have the inventory. Now, tell me how Google, Airbnb, Booking, Expedia, what are they gonna do if we don't give them availabilities? If the Casco Antiguo in Panama or the whole city of Barcelona or whatever, they say, that's it. We are not gonna give you availabilities for let's say high season, July to August, let's say. Zero availability on Airbnb, zero availability on booking. They, they become, they start as big booking places and they become empty SQL databases running on nothing, right? We have the power to completely empty them from, from the inventory, okay? So I think the game here is not let's beat them at their game of marketing. We won't beat them, but we can, in specific cases, if we unite enough in small niches, I'm not talking about the whole, you know, we are competitors at the same time as we are working together. So, but I think Matt is, is pointing us in the right direction. First, let's get united. Let's have a clear goal and then work on it. Uh, one of the biggest reasons we cannot do direct booking is because through Airbnb, uh, we had so many new people coming into the market who have completely like zero long-term view. They just want to make a, a quick buck, a quick buck. They don't need to, well, as long as it works, they're going to be on Airbnb and they then get off, right? So do you think guys, that's a question, the best way to get to the customers is basically force them to book through us and us will be direct booking, cooperative, trips, whatever. Is this the way to go or should we try something else? Because I'm convinced this is the way to go. You want to book through to booking, you want to book through Airbnb, I'm sorry, there's no availability. Wait until the end of June and then I'm going to open you the calendars on the 1st of July if I've not, I have nothing else in alternative. Uh, yeah, let, let's start again from Vanessa. Let, let's do a quick, a quick round so we can uh, we don't go too far. It's going to be very quick. First, I love, you know, vive la révolution really resonates with me. I'm French, so uh, bring it on. Um, however, I can tell you this, if you don't give your availability, and I know for a fact for two months in high season, then they're going to throw you out. So don't try and come back, right? So that's it. It would have to be a break. Uh, sorry, point. we just, just do it for a period. Like you have 12 months, get the highest, the highest month where you're going to get bookings anyway, and try those. Until, until the time. You won't, they won't allow you back. That's the problem. They throw you out. Well, if you get a booking for two months, they're not going to kick you out, right? 
No, they, they, they'll, okay, so if I tomorrow close my calendar on booking.com for right. the two months of July and August, so I do yeah. availability management, where, you know, and just block everything. Yeah. They're not going to let me back in. They, they're not, okay. They don't want me anymore. They're going to put me down the algorithm. They're quite clever that way. Right? Sure. So, so, so Vanessa, Vanessa, can I, can I, yeah. can I, I mean, you're going to know the answer to this. Mm -hmm. I know sizable managers yeah. who will uh, block their inventory for the entire summer period on all OTAs. Because they're sizable. I guess they can okay. play with that. So the word sizable uh, actually carries. Well, because obviously if you come in with 10,000 rentals, you know, booking.com is not going to, you know, they, they need your inventory, right? Um, but they're not going to be happy about it. Uh, it will affect your algorithm. It has to. It will, will it? affect your algorithm for sure. Well, no, it, but it will. But the summer months, as we know, are the it's, breadwinners. So. Yeah, but it's kind of a no-no. I mean, to them, it's kind of a no-no. If they find you... Oh, they know it. They must know it. There's hundreds of the big thousands. ones, yeah. There's yeah. hundreds of thousands now blocking those days. If I'm a small yeah. host with two apartments and I block July and August, maybe I got mm -hmm. the long-term booking from Airbnb. How does booking know? I mean, are they going to kick out everybody, anyone who gets a long-term booking is going to be kicked out by OTAs? I don't make a policy. All I can tell you is that it's, it's no, don't do it. Okay. <laughs> don't do it, well, it's well, risky. I, I, it's just I've risky. Because you I know. got long-term booking <laughs> and I've done okay. it, so. Yeah. All right, okay, go ahead. I think, I think your big problem, Luca, with, with, I mean, this has been mooted for like 10 or 20 years. If everybody didn't put their properties on the OTAs, they'd have to go somewhere else. The problem is that you're in such a fractured, fragmented, desperate environment. People actually want bookings. And it doesn't matter how many people you speak to, they will always go for multiple distribution and try and find the opportunity to make a booking. They might talk a good game together, unless they're actually pulled together in some form of financial constraint. You won't, you won't ever achieve that herd mentality uh, in that environment. I think that's a really difficult thing to do. I think the easier thing to do is to actually uh, have an alternative that actually has better commercial arrangements for them better direct contact, better, um, better reviews, uh, control, all that sort of stuff, which is what essentially TRIPS is doing. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's the visibility and you can't have visibility on a global scale. You can only have visibility on local scales to start with. But remember 25 years ago, I forget what it's called, Luca, you'll remember this. There used to be networks of, of people pulling together organizations and they created rings. There were rings of organizations. And that, that's a potential opportunity going forward. So if Matt over in Miami there actually had a consortium who wanted to put it together, they could link to our consortium in the UK, which could link to the consortium in Rome, uh, La Rome which could link to the consortium in Barcelona, et cetera. So there is the capacity to do it. Technology is still a little unstable to allow all this uh, complete uh, integration in a stable manner. But in a few years, I'm pretty sure that will all be ironed out. So, how did Fairly a partner did, Vanessa? They did it, right? Uh, Fairly a partner, you put the link yeah. here. How yeah, did yeah, they do yeah. it? How did they do it? I think the company is quite, I mean, it's, I think it's about 10, 15 years old. Uh, it's, it's quite okay. a long time they've been around. And uh, don't know how it, how, did, how it started, I don't know. Can I, um, I've got another question to ask Vanessa now, she's yeah, on here as well. Sure. One of the really things, hot, but tell me. One of the yes. things we've witnessed in, in this cooperative aggregative website approach, which people like, and particularly niche websites, is mm -hmm. that there are some PMS companies out there who are very loath to actually share the inventory from their suppliers with other websites. So I won't mention any names, but they go, no, I don't want to connect because, you know, it might dilute our opportunity going forward. So you're saying PMS is not connecting to, yeah. to listing sites because they don't want to dilute? No. Um, somebody, might come up, somebody might come up with a niche website and okay. the PMS has a manager so on it. You might have 500 properties and they say, I want to connect to that 
niche listing website. Oh. But that has to go via Rentals United. Now we don't use right. Rentals United, we do this directly. You see, there's a, right. a silo of information that controls the inventory again. And I don't think that's right. I think they should say, fine, here's the API, you pay for it, we connect to Rentals United, it goes off to the listing website. Yeah, correct. So, you know, yeah. this, this, this transactional of, of data is incredibly difficult to manage at this moment in time. It's not open source enough, which is what Luke has been talking about the whole time. Open but I think between, between Luca and, and, and Rentals United, I think we could, there could be a boom of, of niche websites, don't you think? We have the, no, really, the contracts made yeah. directly. We give yeah. you the inventory to, to you know, you make the, yeah. the code and, uh, and off you go. And, and everybody can get all of this inventory and make niche websites uh, as they please. Yeah. Sounds yeah. great. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Time on Let's what go you're home. <laughs> what would you say? Well, as you, as you can see, I, as you can see in Switzerland, the sky is blue and not pink. <laughs> and, uh, I, I find it, uh, we're talking very theoretical right now. It's a hypothesis that I can, for the time being, not support, you know. And, and you know, one thing is we need to start at the point that Matt is mentioning. And we talked about this in, in other webinars, uh, Matt and I as well, that we talk about this community and, and building a stronger awareness for, for the entire industry. And I think what COVID has done, it has decentralized our industry dramatically, by the way. So... You know, nobody's talking about uh, consolidation anymore at all. So consolidation has literally failed. Um, and, uh, you know, master lease has failed. Uh, we've seen some brutal uh, news in the last couple of weeks. Um, we have seen some brutal news for big vacation rental companies who have tried to uh, centralize. And we're now decentralizing again. Interesting enough, massive changes in shareholder structure, investments, and everything else. And we have started to decentralize. So it's actually our ecosystem of vacation rental is becoming more decentralized than ever before. And I think that will going is going to remain because we have failed to include the destination into our business. And I think that's one thing that I've forgot to mention: uh, the DMOs and the role of DMOs by actually aggregating content and providing content together with the ones who are executing EMOs the actual with work. nation managers, right? Correct. So I think, you know, in, in, we can look at the hotel lobby. I mean, at the end of the day, while we're decentralizing now and become again dependent, we will always be opportunistic in our choices, regardless. And uh, maybe I'm, I, I don't have to pink clouds and I, I wish, certain things are going to change. And I think, I think COVID-19 will change quite a few things in our life and our world for time to come. But ultimately, the human being has never learned. I mean, history tells us that over thousands of years, we have never learned from anything that has happened. We, we just want to go back as quickly as we can to what we had before, because we don't want to let go, right? And we've just had it too good in the last 50 years in Second World War in this world and now something is brutally disrupting and i say you know people are opportunistic while they're trying to find different ways of these dist for distributing content then they might use it for a time being but when when something goes better than the other they will go back to where they were before because at the end of the day they need demand and if if otas can deliver demand or anybody else can deliver demand that's where they're going to stick so so again, I, I totally believe in this community aspect and actually being more together in, in solving a particular issue. And we need to trust that this is going to solve a lot of our challenges, help us with the margin compression we're dealing with on a daily basis. But we don't have, if we don't have confidence in that, nobody wants to be the first mover. And hotel lobbies, I mean, they, they're brutally strong, but they haven't been able to pull together and, and do something meaningful at all because they're being opportunistic at the end of the day. And every hotel thing is going to be opportunistic again. Is I'm going to jump on, I'm going to stay with the OTAs. They will give me demand and my hotel is going to be full to the, to the rim. And the others are not, it's their problem. And if, the, if it's somewhere else, then I jump somewhere else. So I think this opportunistic approach will remain, but I think we need to include all stakeholders within the industry to, to Matt's point, to actually orchestrate that in an in a, in a associate fashion, if you wish, and then really try to carve out the real value to do something different to what we have done before. And then I think you have 
uh, potential ways and means in going forward to to bring a community together to make a serious shift there is a oh yeah yeah Finley, we will we, we'll let matt say that last one and then we're gonna close matt you want to say how we're gonna do the this you know if you had to run a cooperative how would you make the the customer acquisition would you close the calendars would you do something else the customer acquisition what what customer acquisition? Like, you know if you organize this property managers in a city how would you get your direct bookings basically oh i i don't think you do it overnight i think you do it with a plan over time um i've been preaching for the last several years uh, a methodology that we call listing site non-dependence it's using the listing sites to generate the first booking and bringing those guests onto your own court and building up a, a network of repeat referrals uh, I, I still think that over time if you're doing that consistently you begin to build up uh, something that starts to resemble uh, sustainability it, it would take a, a whole lot of balls to just shut down all your listings on a listing site uh, especially with these kinds of repercussions that Vanessa mentioned for me it ultimately boils down to when is it so painful that you can't <laughs> help but make a change um, there are plenty of doctors that will tell you people you know, are told if they don't stop smoking, they're gonna die and they don't stop smoking. So maybe there is no light at the end of this pain tunnel, uh, but I would hope that the people that are, um, that make up our industry, they have chosen to participate in this space because they love it. it it's not a way to make a quick buck for them. They do it because it gives them purpose. They do it because it means something in their lives. That's an advantage um, in the decision-making process. So I think uh, to summarize all of those wonderful thoughts on this last question, cr creating a kind of collaborative platform for local destinations to work together having both individually and as a group a plan to take advantage of all the tools that are out there because listing sites are by far the cheapest way to generate bookings in the history of mankind uh, but also having a plan to take those bookings and bring them into your own court over time that kind of plan with an orchestrated group effort begins to look like something independent in the future Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So we'll end it up here. Thank you for staying a bit, a bit longer. Um, I invite anyone and everyone to register to the next one on Thursday. We're going to talk about open protocols um, with uh, three people from three companies uh, who are doing software integrations and channel managers and, and so on. So that's going to be also interesting. Thank you very much. This video is going to be available on uh, on YouTube in the next days. And uh, great, it's been it's been great. Thank you so much. Can I say one Enjoy last your holidays. thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, if people want to read up on co uh, cooperatives, um, there's a fantastic author. His name's Nathan Schneider, and he ri he's written two books which just blew my mind. The first is called um, "Hours to Hack and to Own." And the second book is called Everything for Everyone. Two really good primers on how cooperatives work and how uh, it may be able to apply to your destination. And we actually interviewed him uh, for the last episode of our podcast. So I'll get to share that with the Vacation Rental community too. Great. I got Thanks. the links and I, and I link your podcast too under the YouTube video. Thank you very much. Everyone. Nice to see you guys. See you somewhere. Cheers, somewhere. Thanks guys. So much. Ciao. <laughs> bye. 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 Miss you. <laughs> yeah.